In this episode, I have three very weird and strange encounters, and the last encounter is narrated by my friend over at Weird Encounters. I'll put the link to his channel below. If you're a long-time listener and still haven't subscribed, then let me be the first to welcome you aboard. Now let's get to the stories. I worked in a national park for a few years in the Southwest. I don't really want to say the name of the park on here, but it's a pretty famous one, so you've most likely heard of it. I worked at one of the many information stations we had around the park. Mostly it involved handing out maps, explaining trails, and checking in guests for guided tours. Sometimes I got to give small tours and host educational talks about the history of the area and our local wildlife. We tended to hire quite a few seasonal staff during the busy season to keep things running smoothly. We didn't have as many visitors in the winter, so we could run on a skeleton staff. Typically, the trails would get some snow in December, January, and February. It's not usually much, but it's enough to make the trails icy and extremely dangerous. The unfortunate part about working the winter season with the skeleton crew was that we all had to do a little bit of everything. One day, I had been tasked to restock the cafeteria display in the main lodge. We don't offer room service or meals like a hotel, but we do have a cafeteria where our guests can purchase pre-made food. I would have to get up at 4 a.m. to have the display stock before it opened. Now, I'm not much of a morning person, so I asked my supervisor if I could do it at night instead. I had the keys to the building and planned to go there after everything was shut down for the day. My supervisor was one of the lead rangers at the park. He said he didn't care when I got the cafeteria done, just that it was done before 6 a.m., I took this to mean that he knew I would be doing it at night, but judging by what happened later that night, he definitely forgot I was going to be there. I'll admit, I did start quite a bit later than I had planned. It was nearly 11 p.m. by the time I started restocking. I know that sounds pretty late, but I'm a night owl, and it was sort of nice to be able to work without anyone else there. I was only about 20 minutes into my task when I heard the cafeteria door open. I was in the back of the kitchen, but it was a heavy door, and there was no mistaking it. I knew only someone with a set of keys could be in here, so I knew it was one of my co-workers. I was about to check who it was when I heard my supervisor's voice. It sounded like he was talking on the phone. I heard him walk to the counter and grab something. It sounded like a yogurt cup, but that's really not important. I was still behind the kitchen door, but he was close enough that I could hear half of his phone conversation. It might be important for me to say that the cafeteria lights are always on at the front of the counter, even through the night. So he truly had no idea I was back there. I thought I should just probably walk out with an armful of food for the counter so he would know that he wasn't alone. But then he started talking about some strange things, so I stayed back. He was talking about footprints on one of the main trails in the canyon. Bare footprints, as in without shoes, in December. There was a light dusting of snow on the ground, so any strange footprints should have been pretty easy to follow. I know there are some crazy hikers out there, but no way is someone hiking without shoes in this type of weather. At this point, I'm thinking that they're talking about a missing hiker, and we hadn't had any reports of missing hikers lately. But then my supervisor said something odd. He said, it's best to leave it well enough alone. It doesn't want to harm anyone. It? That was the word that stuck out to me. He wouldn't have described an animal as being barefoot. And he wouldn't have called a person it. I didn't know what to think. I scooted closer to the kitchen door so I could hear better. The conversation sounded pretty tense. They weren't arguing, but they were close to it. My supervisor told the other person that their services weren't needed and that no one has had any negative encounter with the creature yet. Things got a little heated, and I couldn't hear everything that was said, but I do remember exactly what my supervisor said before he hung up the phone. He said, If you want to hunt it, go ahead, but you'll never find it, even with a fresh trail. A lot of people have tried. I waited until I heard the front door open and close before I stuck my head out of the kitchen. I definitely wasn't supposed to hear that conversation but I had to know what they were talking about. However, I was left with more questions than answers. I wasn't able to put the story together until the following day at lunch, 
when I was talking to one of my co-workers who had been working the morning shift in the cafeteria. She told me that a hiker had stopped to talk to her a bit. He was heading out a couple of days early because of the trail conditions. He tried to hike into the canyon, but had to turn back, and on his route back, he saw some footprints in the snow. Bare human footprints. He said he reported it to the ranger station and called the non-emergency police line and asked if there were any reports of missing people in the area because the rangers weren't taking him seriously. He asked my co-worker if she heard anyone that has gone missing. The hiker was convinced that there was someone out there wandering around the canyon without shoes. I didn't know what to think. I still don't know what to think. I haven't seen any strange creatures in the park myself, but from the little bits of information I overheard, I don't think these things want to be seen. I couldn't tell you what they look like, just that they have human feet, and according to my supervisor, they don't pose a threat to people, but I know there's something out there. My buddy Mark is a paleontologist for real like one of those dudes you see in the movies. Anyway, once he had a fossil hunting expedition planned, and his usual group couldn't make it, so he asked me to go with him. Now, I don't know anything about it, but he promised to train me and feed me, so I agreed. We went in his Ford expedition out to this secret location in the Badlands. I assumed he had permission to go on this land, but I didn't really ask. He had his two-person tent in the back, and a bunch of dinty more beef stew, which isn't my idea of provisions, but I wasn't in charge of this thing. When we got there, it was late morning, but already hot. He gave me a hat and we started poking around in this big dry area of dirt and patches of grass. Part of it was a canyon, so it was like being inside a huge bowl. I got bored after about 20 minutes of watching him poke around, and I saw some strange tracks in the dirt that looked fresh. I asked him what he thought they were, and he said maybe a bird or something. It would have had to be a monster bird, though, because those tracks were as big as my feet. I followed them until they disappeared out of the canyons, just because I was bored. They seemed to go in a grassy place, and then off into a group of trees. I started googling on my phone, and I couldn't find any tracks that looked like the ones I found, at least not that size. It sounds crazy, but they look most like chicken feet. Three toes with, in this case, huge claws. I asked Mark if he thought it might be a dinosaur, and he looked at me and told me to go drink some water. I did that and thought about the dinosaur idea. Thing is, this monster seemed to be walking on two legs. Finally, it got too dark to look anymore. I was starving, and even Dinty Moore sounded good. Mark got a fire going and heated up a couple of cans while I put up the tent. I forgot how bad I sleep in tents. Even though I was tired as heck from the day wandering around the canyon, I still couldn't sleep. I kept thinking I was hearing something walking around the outside of the tent, and I also couldn't stop thinking about those tracks. I guess I finally got to sleep, though, because the next thing I knew, I smelled coffee. I went outside and Mark had another fire going and he made a pot of coffee and some box-mixed pancakes. I wanted to use a bathroom before I ate, but, of course, there was no bathroom out there. I went behind the tent and freaked out because I saw a ton of those tracks right at the back of the tent, like the thing had been pacing around there all night. Now, Mark had to be worried, I thought, so I brought him around the tent and showed him the tracks. He repeated that it had to be a bird. I put my foot next to the track to show him how big it was. I guess ostriches might have feet that big, but wouldn't we notice ostriches out here? Mark didn't have any theories, and he really wasn't that interested. He just wanted to look for fossils, which was pretty crazy to me. Why all the excitement about ancient dead creatures when we have a living one right around here? I was curious, but I wasn't scared until that night. I slept even worse than the night before, but Mark was out like a light. I got bored lying there trying to sleep, so I went outside and got another fire going. The fire made some crackling noises, but over it I heard something walking around. Not around, I realized, but toward me. A few seconds later I saw it. I thought at first it was just a trick of the firelight, 
because what I was seeing was a dinosaur thing standing upright, staring at me with these piercing yellow eyes. It looked like it was covered in snake-like scales. It had a snake or dinosaur or maybe like a lizard head. It kept coming toward me. I wanted to scream, but, but I was afraid if I did, Mark would come out of the tent and this thing would get both of us. I didn't know what to do, honestly. I ran around to the other side of the fire, thinking that it might throw the thing off and at least give me a few seconds to think. I couldn't just run because who knew if I'd be faster, and I couldn't get in the car and leave Mark. While I was thinking, the thing was coming around the fire slowly. I couldn't figure out why it just didn't attack and get it over with. Reptiles are fast. It could have eaten me by now. I decided that it was scared of the fire. At least, I hoped it was. I grabbed a stick that was on fire. I didn't even care if I burned myself at that point. It was better than dying. I ran at the thing like a crazy person waving that stick around, figuring I had nothing to lose. It worked. The thing started to back away and finally turned and ran up the ridge. Once my heart stopped pounding, I realized I had no way to convince Mark to leave. I wish I'd gotten a picture of the thing so he knew I wasn't crazy. I sat by the fire until morning and it didn't come back. When the sun came up, I made coffee and breakfast and told Mark we had to go. I don't think he believed my story, but he agreed. Probably because he'd found a good number of fossils anyway. I told him he shouldn't come back here again. At least not at night, but I doubt he'll ever listen to me. I used to be a ranger in Kentucky and handled quite a variety of duties over the course of my time there. At one point, part of my job was to keep the recreational shooting sports range operating. I grew up in a family that liked to shoot and hunt, so my dad had trained me to know what I was doing around guns. I really geek out about firearms and I have a bit of an obsession with maintaining them and using them responsibly. I'd lived in Kentucky my whole life, and my family's land was nearby to the National Forest where I worked. My family owns 20 acres of land, so I like to go out there when I was practicing. I had purchased a new rifle and needed a sight in my gun after I bought it. I'd gotten a drum magazine, and I wanted to test out its reliability. My family had owned that land for decades. Nothing weird had ever happened out there that I knew of. I'd taken people to that spot plenty of times. I had the brand new magazine and hadn't had a chance to use it yet. I grabbed my gun, the drum, and 20 rounds of ammo and went to the field I liked to use. To get to the field, I had to go through a barbed wire fence and a few hundred feet of wooded area. It was an unusually cold day. As soon as I crossed over the barbed wire, something felt off. I'd been there a thousand times, and like I said... I never had any weird experiences, but something felt really strange that day. I kept going through because I thought I was being paranoid, or the wind and air pressure were just right to give an eerie feeling. So I walked on deeper into the woods. The further I got, the stronger the feeling was. I got halfway and the feeling was getting pretty intense. When I had grabbed my ammo, I hadn't loaded it into the magazine because I wanted to hurry and get out to the field so I could set everything up there. I stopped dead in my tracks and loaded the magazine with the 20 rounds I had brought. I felt like I needed to be ready, just in case. Then, out of nowhere, I smelled something dead. I'd been standing there for a few minutes with no scent, and then all of a sudden... It smelled like a month-old rotting carcass was beside me. I looked around, and behind me I saw a mangled animal. Aside from the smell, it looked pretty fresh. It was just so mangled, though, it was really hard to tell what it was. It was a white-gray color. I thought it was a rabbit or a possum. The smell didn't go along with the freshness of the carcass. Whatever that stench was, it wasn't coming from the animal. I finished loading the magazine and stuck it in my gun. I held the bolt open so that if I tripped, the gun wouldn't fire accidentally. I was nearly out of the thick woods, and I could see the field I was heading to straight ahead. The whole time, I'd been walking alongside a creek. 
The creek turns to the left as you approach the field. As I got to the turn in the creek, I heard a loud splash in the water. I turned around, and what I saw, I'll never forget. The thing was easily eight feet tall and was standing on two legs. Besides the water splash, it was dead silent. It had very long arms and long legs. It was light brown, like grayish brown. It didn't look like fur, though, more like skin. The skin was really bedraggled and hanging off of it. It looked severely malnourished. It was incredibly skinny and the skin was tight across its body. Imagine taking a fully grown man that only weighs 120 pounds and stretching him out to be eight feet tall. It had an odd walk, too, but that could have been caused by the mud near the creek bed. It never faced me, so I didn't get a chance to see its front. It just kept walking and never turned around. I think the freakiest thing about it was its size. It scared the absolute crap out of me. I tried to close the bolt on my gun to chamber around just in case it turned around to fight. I had no intention of shooting unless it gave a sign it was going to attack. But when I tried to chamber around, the magazine wouldn't let go of the round. The force of the bolt closing would break your finger if you were to close it on your finger. I'd been loading and unloading the magazine the day before to help loosen the spring to make it easier to load in the future. I could take the rounds out with my hand, but when I came across this terrifying creature, somehow, it decides it wants to hold on to the freaking bullet. By now the thing was out of my sight, and I was just standing there feeling defenseless. After it walked off, I realized if I had shot, I would have deafened myself. It caught me so off guard that I almost fired a 5.56 round in a heavily wooded area without ear protection. I had brought some with me, but didn't have it on. I have no idea what that thing was, but all I can do is thank God it walked away from me. The weird thing was, I had the feeling it was something not of this world. And it's not like me to think that. It felt like something almost supernatural. The magazine never did work right. I had to send it back because it was tearing up my ammo. I never saw that thing again, but I always felt really paranoid in the area after that.